So I'm going to um, introduce Doug Anderson to you first, and um, then Martina Spada will follow uh, Doug. Undress is what the angel of death says to each soul passing from life into the afterlife. In Doug Anderson's new book titled Undress, she said, Anderson gladly and courageously disrobes, revealing a lifetime of assimilated wisdom and remarkably diverse experience, ranging from acting in off-Broadway plays, playwriting, photographing, taxi driving, playing drums in a jazz band, overcoming drug addictions and alcoholism, <laughs> teaching English and creative writing, writing reviews for the New York Times and other papers, serving as a combat medic in the Marine Corps in Vietnam at the height of the Vietnam War in 1967, suffering from PTSD, pursuing and earning a PhD in English at the University of Connecticut, and too many other vocations and avocations to mention here. Doug started writing poetry after he moved to Northampton, Massachusetts in the mid-1990s, where he was fortunate enough to work with the poet Jack Gilbert. He's the author of the poetry collections The Moon Reflected Fire, the winner of the Kate Tufts Discovery Award, which recounts his experience in Vietnam. Keep Your Head Down, Vietnam, the 60s, and A Journey of Self-Discovery, that was published by W.W. W. Norton. Blues for Unemployed Secret Police in 2000. Um, and most recently, as I just mentioned, Undress, She Said. Doug published his second book of poetry with Barrow Street Press titled Horse Medicine. His awards include a grant from the Eric Matthew King Fund of the Academy of American Poets, National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, and a Pushcart Prize. He has taught at the University of Connecticut, Eastern Connecticut State University, and the William Joyner, Joyner Center for the Study of War and its Social Consequences, and the University of Massachusetts in both Boston and Amherst. In, Doug's Ander in Doug Anderson's collection, Andres, he said, his editor at the Four Away Books writes, we accompany, quote, we accompany a speaker undaunted by the complex reckonings of history, evolving relationships in an aging body, a speaker that besieged by a storm resolves to set out into it, the wind playing the rigging like a harp. That's a line from one of his poems. Over and over in these pages, Anderson makes music of the gales and the rain and turbulent sea. Those po these poems voyage from the subtle violence of a religious upbringing to complex rem remembrances of time served in the Vietnam War to contemporary emergencies of real and political plagues. Yet no matter the subject, compassion rudders these lyrics as they turn away and at last to, my and to, and at last to myriad beloveds, the, ed the enigmatic angel of death literary and mythological influences, kind strangers, the constantly elusive, constant moon. Those words reach out to the, these words reach out to the reader in the way that the poet addresses frozen joy from the confines of winter. Red berry, trapped in ice, let me touch you. End of quote. And I would simply add, these poems resonate with a vintage quality of an intensely self-examined life in the hand of, a not only, of not only a highly intelligent, intimate writer, but one who is also enormously gifted as a poet, who crosses over again and again from himself to other, whether he's in a hostile jungle, or on a stage, in a classroom, on a sidewalk, or in the quiet of his study. Please welcome Doug Anderson. Okay. 
Thank you, Shar. That's a beautiful introduction. Appreciate it. Good morning. Can you hear me okay out there? Very good. Good. All over town. I am aware that at this hour, in houses and apartments all around me, people are stepping into their showers. I make the water hotter as I grow used to it, steam rising around me, soothing me, clearing my nostrils. I reach for the soap and lather myself. Wash my scant hair behind my ears, remembering my grandmother long ago, scrubbing me as if I were a burnt pot. I am gentle now, knowing the hurt places I've gathered. I tune myself to a lover's hands, remember the last woman who was good at it. All over town, people are being tender with themselves in this hour between waking and dressing, before putting on the gang face to go to work, chasing away whatever wisps of dreams might be hanging on. I feel for scars above my eyebrows from fighting, the ridge of my twice broken nose, the side of my face where they dug out the big chunk of cancer and the long suture marks on my neck where they took the graft to pluck it. My throat, a broken cathedral organ of backed up love. My ailing left shoulder, my once proud chest, moving on down to the love handles to the gut beneath which the ribbed muscles, the fading burns on my hands, the pitted flesh from the bullet fragments now mostly covered with tattoo, my shop-worn cock and my balls hanging all day in the dark by themselves, scheming, my disintegrating right knee, torn ligaments of the other leg down toward the feet almost crushed now under the weight of a life. For a moment at this hour, perhaps, we are all this way. It makes me sad that we are alone in this holy of holies, grieving the failing flesh beneath which death sits in her carriage, loosely holding the reins. Uh, COVID got me thinking about uh, Boccaccio reading groups or storytelling groups. Anyhow, I began to write in that mode. When the plague came and all were shuttered in their houses, the animals came into the cities and filled the streets. Bears scattered the pigeons, goats raided the grain stores, and vultures stood on the chimney tops and waited. The king dying, began to flail with knives, and before they restrained him, killed seven courtiers. The moon was yellow in the iron sky. When it became full, a madman appeared in the street at the edge of town, naked and singing. He was covered with hair and smelled of silage and dead leaves. The animals gathered around him, a horse bent to groom him of his lice, and a bat hung in his beard. He said, salt, wine, blood, gold, and the watering troughs are full of stars. There is a man who walks foot to foot with me upside down, and when he goes left and I go right, the pain makes me love you more than ever. You who have rejected me as well as those who've left food for me and crossed yourself in the belief you'll be saved. He walked on, and the animals followed him out of town. No one knew his name, but called him Hornfoot, Root Rot, Lunato, Cringe, and Frederick the Dead. When the plague was gone and people came out into the streets to dance, no one remembered him. He had taken the plague with him. But they didn't see the wide circle he made through the fields as he headed back toward them at harvest time. All right. Wings. 
Been so long since I've been loved, even touched, I told her, with no self-pity in my voice, just fact. And she reached over and took my hand in both of hers and felt deftly its several bones and worn gristle that held them in place, as if she were holding a bird that hit a glass door to feel it come back to life in her hands. Uh, uh, masturbation. That's the name of the next one. Right, right. Okay. Masturbation. My mother caught me at it when I was 11. I was embarrassed, as I was when later she caught me kneeling in prayer. The two seemed one now, a moment when I am honest with myself. I kneel beside the bed. The sheets are clean. There are blankets, yes, and pillows. There is a window looking out where two horses graze. I uh, used to have uh, a male angel of death. His name was Mort, and he was a very sarcastic and, you know, unvalidating person. So I fired him. And uh, my new angel of death has magenta hair and a nose ring and various other judgments. She's uh, different. Okay. The angel of death. She is here again with her little black car, wings folded and tucked under her sweater. Her magenta hair, nose ring, black socks with little skulls. She is taking me for the usual morning ride. She says, see how the fog hangs below Mount Sugarloaf and the tip appears bright in the sun. See how the old farmer bends to fix his tractor in the field, how the river resists the ice that crusts near the bank, how even in fog the colors persist, the leaves hanging on for one more day, another wind, it is not so bad, she says. What you have is the longer death, the dying, the composting of the soul. She drives me up the mountain, and we stand overlooking the valley, the river a snake twisting to shake off the cold, the fields heavy with manure. Before the first snow, we let the wind carve us into silence. I want you to get used to me, she says, so when I come for the last time, you won't be frightened. You've seen me before. I was there when you tried to keep a man from bleeding to death. I was there when you could not stand to live another day without the woman who broke you. She leads me back down the mountain, and then I'm alone and tasting the first rich coffee of the morning. I smell her perfume the rest of the day. My heart. A friend chides me about the number of poems in my new book, mostly about failed love, that have the word heart in them. I go through the MS and remove a few hearts. Find another way to say heart. And now my real heart, failing like all the other muscles, has acquired a cardiologist. He's inserted a monitor in my chest that broadcasts wirelessly to his office where a nurse checks each beat. They can do nothing if I drop dead in my sleep. I dreamed about a certain woman again last night. I am broadcasting to her far away in Boston my love and my grief. I will not have love like this again. At 79, I think of other ways to love. Google says the heart's electrical field is 60 times greater in amplitude than the electrical activity generated by the brain. My brain's helping me write this, but it's helpless against the errant neurons, which, like a tarot fool, have me with one foot always stepping off a cliff the fool will not be quiet. He says, love now. Says, ashes to ashes. Someone will stir them back to flame. Yeah. Yeah. 
I was preaching to the choir, and they said I needed some new material. And I said, the old material is the new material. And they said, you need to change something. Different instrumentation, different outfit, something. And I said, you've stopped singing with me, why? And they said, it's that old organ. So I installed new foot pedals and pull the controls that could make it vibrate all the way through you to the ground, below theory, below knowledge, on into something like a soul, where we remembered why and who we were and how terrible the world and we could smell it, taste it, hold it against our hearts. And they said, that's better. Now let's start again. And I said, yes, one more from the top. Some songs you can't hear enough. I do a lot of photography of farms in particular and uh, old houses, old farmhouses. Um, and this on a trip to Chesterfield, New Hampshire one day, near Chesterfield, New Hampshire. I had to stop and photograph it. The old farmhouse was leaning left and overrun with vines, frayed curtains of another life, whipped by the wind that came through the broken windows. I signaled and pulled over. Guy behind me leaned on his horn. I let him pass, got out, and began to photograph. But he stopped his truck a few yards away, began shouting, You stupid fuck! You motherfucker! You... I turned, thought maybe he would get out and come for me, and me at 79, not much looking for a fight. Cocksucker! He shouted. You dumb fuck! As I listened, I heard a high-pitched grieving at his anger's edge. Someone hurting so bad, a minor inconvenience seemed a deliberate infliction upon a much inflicted life. He shouted, and I thought he'd begin to cry if he kept on. And then he burned rubber and was gone, the filthy, fish-tailing truck, off to the bar or accident or weekend in jail. A frightened wife locked in the bathroom. Oh, Lord, help us now and in the hour of our death. Yeah. I gave my hands the day off, and they couldn't wait to get out of the house. I heard them slam the door. Right went to the bookstore, left to the fair, where it became webbed with cotton candy and got its fingers sucked. Right got lost in a volume of Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy and is twitching to write something. So much better for them to be away for the day. How much mischief they would find at home where their owner, heart heavy as a bull's, longs to cuss cup breasts and buttocks, or trace the gentle curve of a neck. He sits in his chair and plots revenge, invents a project for each finger, or gives in to despair and wants a burning star to crucify each palm. Orchid. Finally, a small wind to move the curtains hot in this upstairs room. Outside, the dogs sleep on the cool concrete floor of the, gara of the garage. I don't know why I'm thinking of you just now, why you appeared in my mind like a time lapse of an orchid opening. I am naked, sperm drying on my belly. Loneliness locks the door. I've only used heart four times so far. <laughs> Poetry, a river. If you set out on it, raft or riverboat, if you sound your way through the sandbars and submerged 
barbed wire. If you watch the crows riding the floating corpses without despair, if you unzip your chest and leave your heart lit to navigate at night, if you gamble away your last gold piece, then lean on the rail and watch the catfish eat God knows what and love it. If you get down river far enough, pass the heaps of burning tires and shanty towns and siren songs. If you get past the island of mediocrities feasting on their prizes, if you turn your face from that celebrity hunger, if you don't care, you're drowned out by the world's stock car race and stage smashed guitars. If you are content with the soft glow you make in the shadow of the grand whiz bangs, if you are vigilant, intrepid enough to scoop up a star before the diving pelican takes it, if you get that far and still right, and you see the place where the mud water swirls in the gulf like smoke, Maybe then, maybe then. All right. Crown of Thorns Blues. Jesus under an old Westinghouse box keeps the rain off. Once I saw a woman passed out on concrete, concrete on Fifth Avenue, dressed in green garbage bags, twisted into an elegant sarong. The rich man's corpse kisses the homeless man's at the city morgue. The medical examiner thinks he'll buy new golf clubs as he makes the first cut. The trophy wife sweats on the treadmill so she'll fit inside her husband's secretary's silhouette. Somebody sprayed a dollar sign on an old stray dog. Time to send the soul to the cleaners. Hope it doesn't get lost with all the others hanging on the spin rack. I could go home with yours by mistake. Never could get the stain out of mine. Um, in Vietnam, the uh, black guys called each other splibs. That was a word of respect. The uh, black guys called the white guys chucks. Not necessarily a term of respect. Splibs and chucks. He said, don't raise up, Doc. I'm going to lay down hell just over your head with the 60. And so I started to crawl down the sandy slope with the brother moving those rounds an inch in front of my nose all the way into the kill zone to work on a man already dead. If you'd seen us, splibs and chucks, all with snake brains on fire, you'd never know we were taught to hate each other in some funky-ass bean town in Mississippi. We had a thing, not the politician's thing with all the flags, but something, some kind of meaning dug out of the bloody mud to keep us whole and alive because you need heart to get up and fight another damn day even if you no longer know why. Our why was made up out of brotherhood. We fought for each other. Let me tell you something. When a black man's bleeding out, you have to pull back his lower lip to check for cyanosis. Next day, I gladly did. I tried like hell, but couldn't keep him alive. Not one damn day goes by, I don't think of him. Yeah. Driving down Route 9 last night. Past the VA hospital, a cool and velvety night without foreboding. When I saw him form himself from the pavement, gold center line and black paving, fleshing a skeleton and then dressed in jungle utilities, he is running in a crouch with his rifle thrust in front of him across the road and into the tall grass. On the other side, I slammed on the brakes just in time to miss him, sat by the road and waited till my heart slowed down. 
then pulled back onto the empty road as if nothing had happened, as if there'd never been a war, as if my mind made things up just to test the brakes. Coming up on Halloween, All Hallows' Eve, Samhain, Dia de Muertos, the time when the walls between the living and the dead are thinnest. Believe me, it has nothing to do with Batman and candy corn. It's been a while since I've seen the dead. I don't know what jogged my mind. Maybe the floater that troubles my left eye. Maybe a trick of light on pavement. When my mother was dying, she claimed to have spoken to people who'd been dead 30 years as if she could see through the veil and the rest of us could not. I restrained myself forthwith from naming mystery, to kill a live thing with a term, to deny what we become, that we become what we do, soul heavy in the later years. It hurts our knees, but we keep moving, humping a pack of the dead who won't stay quiet. Killing with a name. We were taught to call the enemy gook, slope, dink, and worse, because it's easier to kill that way, easier to sleep at night if you've merely crushed a roach under your boot heel, sprayed poison down some hole, or set a whole village on fire to kill its vermin. But when we dragged that guy out of the hole and stood him up and he blinked in the glare, all five feet of him covered in mud so that even his black pajamas were gray with it. He didn't look like anything you'd want to kill, in spite of his being a tough little shit, taking round after mortar round, rocket after rocket, and still firing back at us while his squad slithered through the leaves and got away. He just stood there, maybe hoping for a quick death, just a shot at the back of the head, no interrogator to slip a hat pin under his nail. I knew then that I couldn't say gook again, could not joke about the burning, the poison lands, where, for reasons that grow dimmer every year, we were sent to fight a war. somewhere south of Da Nang, 1967. At dawn, we sit in ambush outside the village. A cat emerges from the ground fog, sniffs the air, passes through us with indifference. The sun turns the fog to spun glass. Spider webs with drops of dew hang in the trees. We see a saffron shape coming through the fog Safeties are eased off, fingers rest lightly on triggers. A young monk emerges from the fog, kneels on the ground in front of us, closes his eyes, and frowns. We check his ID and send him on his way. A rooster crows in the village. Someone lights a fire. We will not fight today. Ho Chi Minh um, had to leave Vietnam because people were trying to kill him. And he couldn't go back to France because people were trying to kill him. And he went to England uh, where he wasn't safe because people were trying to kill him. So he ended up in the United States working at, uh, as a pastry chef at the Omni Parker House in Boston. Uh, this poem is for him. Imagine him in this dignified monument of dark wood and crystal, the oldest hotel in America, holding up a pastry to see if it's perfect, quietly working nights in his room, writing, planning. They could so easily have killed him in his other exiles, England, France, but he was safe here. He was studying the war for independence we'd try to stop with so much loss. But I think he must have been happy in this sweet interlude of reading Marx and making the most delicate cream cup puffs and croissants. Malcolm would work here too, but later, and their revolutions would run side by side. 
We'd have counted fewer skulls had we been able to see the genius in a single mille fuel lifted to the light. Two more poems. You all remember the Tet Offensive, or some of you remember the Tet Offensive of 1968. That's when the uh, communists overran every single uh, military compound in the country. If I can find it. Tet. 1968-2015, a valentine. Um, a few years ago, I spent years with horses, big draft horses, and for a reason known only to my unconscious, I have added them into this poem. Clouds heaped three tiers high on the horizon. Lighting, lightning whitens the chambers tier by tier all the way up and again thunder like arc light, bombing, and more flashes. They're coming, the colonel said. If you get a heavy concentration of mortars on target or not, they're coming. Arc light along the ridge. There, 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 there. And seconds later, the rumble with its hooves clattering toward me through the trees. Safeties click off like a chatter of cicadas. They're coming. Hear their hoof beats. See the silhouettes of their helmets beneath the camouflage. Flash and crunch, walking them in on us. Flash, shrapnel skittering through the trees, brings down leaves. But now they lean their long faces over the fence. I unhook the cate and go in. They come toward me one by one. I rub them just below the mane, and Merlin, the whole big myth reel of him, grabs my pocket flap with his teeth as if it were a tangled clump of brush that must come off. He grooms me like one of his own. This is love. They are coming, the thunder of them, the soft eye big enough to free fall into the way of the gods, the ears straight up and listening better than any human listening. I wander through them and greet them one by one, 32 of them. When they run, thunder like arc light, thunder like myth. The clouds let tear by tear all the way up, flash and flash again and the rain fragrant in the earth. They are coming and they are full of love and enchantment. The war that is happening always everywhere stops. Their heart beats like arc light, sending, 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 the slow pulse of them, the knowing. Close with this one. I've uh, made a number of trips back to Vietnam and I've gotten to know a lot of my former enemies uh, who are poets and fiction writers and this was the wonderful work of the Joiner Center. Um, Saturday night in Hanoi. The Red River deepens its channel, rumbles its horde of Chinese ivory legionnaires' helmets, Japanese bayonets, shells of American helicopters, jingles the dog tags of the fuck-happy innocents in their missing bone bags and dumps them deep off the delta of history. But tonight, in Hanoi, couples tango in the streets, neon reddening their dignified faces. There were 38 million of them during the war, now 90. Eros sprung back full when the last Americans lifted off the embassy roof. How many times will I come back? As many as necessary, and even after death to sit among the three-strand beards of the other old men and be warmed when they show their tobacco-stained teeth in the slow opening smile. My heart opens its fist. Who knew I'd find love here? This is more home than home because long ago it broke me, then gentled the pieces back into light. 
Stateside people don't talk about this war anymore, carry it like a slow-growing tumor. But here the war is over. In old Hanoi, I can drop my mask, finish my café chou, and wander back out into the streets. An old woman smiles at me for no reason at all, and a child gives me a three-toothed grin, sin chow. There are lovers on motorbikes and the smells of a thousand meals. I breathe it all in. I could die here and be free. I peel a green orange and find gold. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Martina Spada needs no introduction, but here I am about to do the obvious. He has published more than 20 books as a poet, editor, essayist, and translator. His latest book of poems, Floaters, won the 2021 National Book Award and was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. Other collections include Vivas to Those Who Have Failed, The Trouble Ball, The Republic of Poetry, Alabanza, and Imagine the Angels of Bread. He is the editor of What Saves Us, Poems of Empathy and Outrage in the Age of Trump. He has received the Ruth Lilly Poetry Prize, the Shelley Memorial Award, the Robert Clear. Creeley Award, an Academy of Poets Fellowship, the Penn Revson Fellowship, and the Lettres Boricuas Fellowship, and the Guggenheim Fellowship. The Republic of Poetry was also a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, and the title poem of his collection, Alabanza, about 9-11, has been widely anthologized and performed. His book of essays and poems, Zapata's Disciple, was banned in Tucson as part of the Mexican-American Studies Program, outlawed by the state of Arizona. A former tenant lawyer in Greater Boston, Espada is a professor of, professor of English at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. In the title poem of his book, Floaters, a poem about the now famous and viral photo of a father and his little daughter who drowned while attempting to cross the Rio Grande. Martine gives them back their dignity by naming them, first Oscar y Valeria, then as if that's not enough, he goes on to add their full names and the full name of Oscar's wife, Tanya, who witnessed their drowning. By naming them, he is telling us this is not just any photo of any two dead immigrants we saw in the paper or on TV. Instead, these people are made more real and dignified because we know their names the same way we know our neighbors' names. They are our neighbors. They are us. Throughout this collection, he enlarges this story to include all immigrants coming to this country, and he personalizes it, as in the poem entitled, The Story of How We Came to America, where he writes of a family legend only to be admonished by his father. That never happened. And besides, you should wait till people are dead to tell stories like that. Now, people are dead, and I am telling stories like that. There is so much more to this collection, tender love poems, and I hope you will hear one. To paraphrase Walt Whitman, Martine sounds his urgent yawp and plea for the dignity of his subjects, 
and his words will itch at your ears until you understand them. So before you scratch, start to scratch, please welcome Martina Spada. Ah, buenas tardes. Better. Well, um, first of all, I want to begin um, by asking you for another round of applause for Doug Anderson. That is poetry. That's the real stuff. Also want to thank uh, Tim Mayo um, for that introduction and for all the other work he's done uh, to put uh, this festival and this reading together. I want to thank Charger Nord, Anne Mullaney, Indigo Radio, Ruth Antoinette Rodriguez, and Antidote Books. Don't forget them in the back. Uh, and I want to thank my wife, Lauren, who is present on every single page of Floaters. Um, I'm going to start off by reading the first poem of the book. Uh, 30 years ago, I was a tenant lawyer. Still got the top half of the suit. Um, I was the director of a program called Su Clinica Legal. Su Clinica Legal in Chelsea, Massachusetts. Um, right across the Tobin Bridge from Boston. Uh, my clients came from the Spanish-speaking Caribbean, Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, and also from Central America, El Salvador and Guatemala. They were refugees from Reagan's wars. Um, and the second half of this poem also refers to the most notorious murder case in the history of Boston, the Chuck Stewart murder case. So we start here, jumping off the mystic Tobin Bridge. I close my eyes and see him windmilling his arms as he plummets from the mystic Tobin Bridge to prove me wrong, to show me he was good, to atone for sins like seeds in the lopsided apple of his heart but mostly to escape from me in the back of his cab, a Puerto Rican lawyer in a suit and tie. I hated the 111 bus, sweltering in my suit and tie with the crowd in the aisle, waiting to hit a bump on the mystic Tobin Bridge so my head would finally burst through the ceiling like a giraffe on a circus train. I hated the 111 bus after eviction day in Chelsea District Court, translating the landlords and judges into Spanish so the tenants knew they had to stuff their clothing into garbage bags and steal away again, away from the 40-watt squint that followed them everywhere that followed me because I stood beside them in court. I would daydream in the humidity of the bus, a basketball hero flipping the balled up pages of the law in the waste basket at the office as illegal aid lawyers chanted my name. I hated the 111 bus. I had to take a taxi cab that day. What the hell are you doing here? said the driver of the cab to me in my suit and tie. You gotta be careful in this neighborhood. There's a lot of Jose's around here. The driver's great-grandfather staggered off a boat so his great-grandson could one day drive me across the mystic Tobin Bridge. But there was no room in the taxi for chalk on a blackboard. He could hear the sawing of my breath as I leaned into his ear, past the bulletproof barricade somehow missing, and said, I'm a Jose. I could see the 40-watt squint in his rearview mirror. I'm Puerto Rican, I said. It was exactly 5 p.m., and we were stuck in traffic in a taxi on the Mystic Tobin Bridge. 
The driver stammered his own West Side story without the ballet, how a Puerto Rican gang stole his cousin's wallet years ago. You think I'm going to rob you? I said, and my suit and tie close enough now to tickle his ear with the mouth of a revolver. I could hear the sawing of his breath. He still wanted to know what I was doing there. I'm a lawyer. I go to court with all the Jose's, I said. Stalled traffic steamed around us, the breath of cattle in the winter air. Uh, where are you going for the holidays? The driver said. I thought about Christmas Eve in court, eviction orders flying from the judge's bench when tenants without legal aid lawyers or children old enough to translate the English of the summons did not answer to their names. Every year, the legal aid lawyers told the joke about the Christmas defense. Your Honor, it's Christmas. I said to the driver, I will be spending Christmas right here with my fellow Jose's. The driver shouted, what do you want me to do? Get out of this cab and jump off the bridge? We both knew what he meant. We both knew about Chuck Stewart, the last man to jump off the Mystic Tobin Bridge. Everybody knew how Chuck drove his wife to Mission Hill after birthing classes, the flash and pop in the dark when he shot her in the head and himself in the belly. Everybody knew how he conjured a black car jacker on the crackling call to 911, the way the Mercury Theater on the air conjured Martians in New Jersey on the radio half a century before. Everybody knew how a hundred cops pounded on door after door in the projects of Mission Hill, locking a black man in a cage for the world to see, like the last of his tribe on exhibit at the World's Fair. Everybody knew how Chuck would have escaped, cashing the insurance check to drive away with a new Nissan, but for his brother's confession, the accomplice throwing the Gucci bag with makeup, the wedding rings, and the gun off the dizzy bridge in Revere. Everybody knew how Chuck parked his new car on the lower deck, left a note, and launched himself deep into the black water. How the cops hauled his body from the river by lunchtime when I walked into the office to tell the secretary, Chuck Stewart just jumped off the Mystic Tobin Bridge. I said nothing to the driver. I almost nodded yes. In the rearview mirror, I confess, for a flash, I wanted him to jump. The driver, the cops, the landlords, the judges, all wanted us to jump off the Mystic Tobin Bridge. All wanted us to sprout gills like movie monsters so we could paddle underwater back to the islands, down into the weeds and mud at the bottom, past the fish-plucked rib cages of the dead, the rusty revolvers of a thousand crimes unsolved, the wedding rings of marriages gone bad, so we washed up on shore in a tangle of seaweed, gasping for air. Last night, still more landed here. Clothing stuffed in garbage bags to flee the god of hurricanes flinging their houses into the sky, or the god of hunger slipping his knife between the ribs. Not a dark tide like the tide of the mystic river, but builders of bridges. You can walk across the bridges they build, or you can jump. You know that theater expression, find your light? I'm trying to find my light. This is uh, the title poem of the book Tim mentioned. And I'm sure most of you remember that photograph. It's the photograph that went viral. Two Salvadoran migrants, father and daughter, who came to be known by their first names, Oscar and Valeria. They drowned crossing the Rio Grande in June of 2019. And this photograph triggered outrage, triggered grief. It also triggered what we now call trutherism. 
Uh, there was an anonymous post in the I'm 1015 Border Patrol Facebook group charging that this photograph was a fake, was doctored. You know, that InfoWars style thinking. And so, this poem is a response to that photograph and these charges. Um, floaters, by the way, is a term used by uh, many members of the Border Patrol to describe uh, someone who is drowned crossing over. So, floaters, epigraph. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and ask. Have you all ever seen floaters this clean? I'm not trying to be an ass, but I have never seen floaters like this. Could this be another edited photo? We've all seen the Dems and liberal parties do some pretty sick things. Anonymous post, I'm 1015 Border Patrol Facebook group. Like a beer bottle thrown into the river by a boy too drunk to cry, like the shard of a styrofoam cup drained of coffee brown as the river, like the plank of a fishing boat broken in half by the river, the dead float. And the dead have a name. Floaters, say the men of the border patrol, keeping watch all night by the river, hearts pumping coffee as they say the word floaters, soft as a bubble, hard as a shoe, as it nudges the body to see if it breathes, to see if it moans, to see if it sits up and speaks. And the dead have names. A feast day parade of names, names that dress all in red, names that twirl skirts, names that blow whistles, names that shake rattles, names that sing in praise of the saints. Say, Oscar Alberto Martinez Ramirez. Say, Angie Valeria Martinez Avalos. See how they rise off the tongue, the calling of bird to bird somewhere in the trees above our heads, trilling in the dark heart of the leaves. Say what we know of them now they are dead. Oscar slapped dough for pizza with oven-blistered fingers. Daughter Valeria sang, banging a toy guitar. He slipped free of the apron he wore in the blast of the oven, sold the motorcycle he would kick till it sputtered to life, counted off pestles for the journey across the river, and the last of his 25 years, and the last of her 23 months. There is another name that beats its wings in the heart of the trees. Say, Tanya, Vanessa, Avalos, Oscar's wife, and Valeria's mother, the witness stumbling along the river. Now their names rise off her tongue. Say, Oscar y Valeria. He swam from Matamoros across to Brownsville. The girl slung around his neck, stood her in the weeds on the Texas side of the river, swore to return with her mother in hand, turning his back as fathers do, who later say, I turned around and she was gone. In the time it takes for a bird to hop from branch to branch, Valeria jumped in the river after her father. Maybe he called out her name as he swept her up from the river. Maybe the river drowned out his voice as the water swept them away. Tanya called out the names of the saints, but the saints drowsed in the stupor of birds in the dark, their cages covered with blankets. The men on patrol would never hear their pleas for asylum, watching for floaters, hearts pumping coffee all night on the Texas side of the river. No one, they say, had ever seen floaters this clean. Oscar's black shirt yanked up to the armpits, Valeria's arm slung around her father's neck. Even after the light left her eyes, both faced down in the weeds back on the Mexican side of the river. Another edited photo. 
See how her head disappears in his shirt, the waterlogged diaper bunched in her pants, the blue of the blue cans. The radio warned us about the crisis actors. We see at one school shooting after another. The man called. Oscar will breathe. Sit up. Speak. Tug the black shirt over his head. Shower off the mud and shake hands with the photographer. Yet, the floaters did not float on the Rio Grande like Olympians showing off the backstroke, nor did the souls float up to Dallas, land of rumored jobs and a president shot in the head as he waved from his motorcade. No bubbles rose from their breath in the mud, light as the iridescent circles of soap that would fascinate a two-year-old. And the dead still had names. Names that sing in praise of the saints. Names of flower and blossoms of white. A cortege of names dressed all in black, trailing the coffins to the cemetery. Carved their names in headlines and gravestones they would never know in the kitchens of this cacophonous world. Enter their names in the book of names. Say, Oscar Alberto Martinez Ramirez, say, Angie Valeria Martinez Avalos, bury them in a corner of the cemetery named for the sainted archbishop of the poor, shot in the heart saying mass, bullets bought by the taxes I paid when I worked as a bouncer and fractured my hand 40 years ago and bumper stickers read, El Salvador is Spanish for Vietnam. When the last bubble of breath escapes the body, May the men who speak of floaters, who have never seen floaters this clean, float through the clouds to the heavens, where they paddle the air as they wait for the saint who flips through the keys on his ring like a drowsy janitor, till he fingers the key that turns the lock and shuts the gate on their babble-tongued faces, and they plunge back to earth, a shower of hailstones pelting the river, the Mexican side of the river. Well, I firmly believe that times of hate call for poems of love. Tim asked for a love poem. Um, my wife, Lauren Maria Spala, is a poet, a novelist, a teacher. Uh, in fact, she taught for many years in urban education, including uh, in Springfield, Massachusetts. So she was leave in the dark, Come home in the dark. That's the setting for this poem. Um, and Obad, of course, is a French verse poem. It refers to the parting of lovers at dawn. And did we ever? Obad with concussion. Epigraph. Poverty is black ice. Naomi Ajala. You leave me sleeping in the dark. You kiss me and I stir. Fingers in your hair, eyes open, unseeing. You leave me asleep every morning, commuting to the school in the city at sunrise. The landlord's driveway, a muddy creek, ices over hard after the freezing rain clatters all night. Your feet fly up your head slamming the ground, an eclipse of the sun flooding your eyes. You sleep under the car. No one knows how long you sleep. You awake with a hundred ice picks stabbing your eardrums. You await coat and hair soaked and somehow drive to school. You remember to turn left at the Smith and Wesson factory. The other teachers lead you by the elbow to Mercy Hospital, where you pause when the nurse asks your name, where you claim your pain level is a four, and they slide you into the white coffin of an MRI machine. You hold your breath. They film your brain. Concussion. 
The word we use for the boxer plunging face first to the canvas after the uppercut blindsided him, not the teacher commuting to school at sunrise in a Subaru Crosstrek. Yet, you would drive, ears hammering as they hammer in the purgatory of the MRI. A week before, Isabella came to you in the classroom and said, Miss, I cannot sleep. Three days. I cannot sleep. Her boyfriend called at 2 a.m. and she did not pick up. At 3 a.m., a single shot to the head put him to sleep, and he will sleep forever, his body hidden beneath a car in a parking lot on Maple Street. The cops, the television cameras, the neighbors all gathering at the yellow tape carnival of his corpse. You said to Isabella, Take this journal, write it down. You don't have to show me. You don't have to show anyone. On the cover of the journal you bought at the drugstore was the word dream. Isabella sat there in your classroom at your desk, pencil waving in furious circles. By lunchtime, as her friends slapped each other, Isabella slept, head on the desk, face pressed against the pages of the journal. This is why I watch you sleep at 3 a.m. when the sleeping pills fail to quell the strike meeting in my brain. This is why I say to you when you kiss me in my sleep, don't go, don't go. You have to go. And since I read you that one, I've got to read you this one. Um, this is the sonnet that I read at uh, our wedding. We got married in the living room by a justice of the peace. And there were three people there. Two witnesses, Paul and Eileen Mariani. And our official wedding photographer. Doug Anderson. <laughs> They've heard this before, but you haven't. Love is a luminous insect at the window. For Lauren Maria Spala, June 13th, 2019. The word love, there it is again. Indestructible as an insect, fly faster than the swatter, mosquito darting through the net. How the word love chirps in every song, crickets keeping a city boy up all night. I wish I could fry and eat them. How the word love buzzes in sonnet after sonnet. I am the beekeeper who wakes from a nightmare of beehives to quote Duran, the Panamanian brawler who waved a glove and walked away in the middle of a fight. No mas, no more. Then I see you watching the violinist, his eyes shut the Russian composer's concerto in his head. White horse hair fraying on the bow and your face is bright with tears. And there it is again, the word love. Not a fly or mosquito, not a cricket or a bee, but the luna moth we saw one night, luminous green wings knocking at the screen on the window as if to say, I have a week to live, let me in. And I do. Well, there are all kinds of love poems. Here's another one. And it's for Paul. Paul Mariani, you may know is a, a poet, a biographer of poets, a teacher, a dear friend, a colleague at UMass, 
And this poem is for him. The title and the last line come from his own poem, uh, Hornet's Nest. So this one is called, Be There When They Swarm Me, for Paul Mariani. You were once the boy of the big shoulders, hauling cartons of Campbell's soup at the AMP in 1959, yearning to bring the boss with a wrench. You were the poet of the great handshake and all the stories, squeezing my arm to tell me about Hart Crane, who leapt from a ship to drown at sea. Did he struggle to regain the surface, suddenly sobered by what he'd done? I wandered lonely as a Puerto Rican in an English department. And you found me in the hallway, calling me brother as my own brother never would, calling me poet as if that word had never drowned at sea. Once I was a boy with big shoulders too, plotting to shrink wrap the foreman's head the night of the layoffs. Not for you, the poet learning to smoke like a poet, bursting into tears at the sight of a mayonnaise jar because he loves the letter M, locking himself in the bathroom because his haiku is too short. <laughs> now, you tell tales of the hospital bed, your spine a wreck, your wobbling brain. Now you write of scrubbing the deck when hornets sting and zoom into your eyes as one winged fiend multiplies by 20, and you win. But no, you cannot win, and so you pray, be there when they swarm me. I wear a leg brace up to the knee. The surgeons open my belly like curious children inspecting the pendulum of a grandfather clock. My insurance will not pay for my hearing aids. At the airport, they stop me because my beard is a suspect. And yet, I will be there when they swarm you. I will arm myself against the hornets with natural insecticides, the eucalyptus oil, the citronella, the spray of chrysanthemum flower tea, and then the baseball bat. Since I was born in Brooklyn, where people and base use baseball bats to smash burglars, cars, television screens, anything but baseballs. We will win, though we know we cannot win. You call me brother in the hallway as my brother never would. Spoke the word poet like a benediction. And so we wait together for the next wave of winged demons. Be there when they swarm me. Okay, I'm going to read one more. Oh, and I hope I have this one memorized because I'm still looking for the light. I'm reading this one because of Hurricane Fiona in Puerto Rico. Um, and for my father. My father, Francisco Luis Espada, Frank Espada, was born in the mountain town of Utuado, Puerto Rico in 1930. He died in Pacifica, California in the year 2014. He was a community organizer, a documentary photographer. When Hurricane Maria, five years ago, struck Puerto Rico, I suddenly saw Utuado everywhere. It was in the headlines, it was in the internet, it was on TV. John Lee Anderson, said, quote, Utuado had become a byword for the island's devastation. And let's not forget that approximately 4,000 people died. And so I started talking to my father, who had died three years before. Uh, more precisely, I started talking um, uh, to his ashes in a box in my bookshelf. And that's the genesis of the last poem you'll hear from me. So thank you for listening. And come see us at the back, the book table. Letter to my father, October 2017. You once said, 
My reward for this life will be a thousand pounds of dirt shoveled in my face. You're wrong. You are seven pounds of ashes in a box, a Puerto Rican flag wrapped around you next to a red brick from the house in Utuado where you were born, all crammed together on my bookshelf. You taught me there is no God, no life after this life, so I know you're not watching me type this letter over my shoulder. When I was a boy, you were God. I watched from the seventh floor of the projects as you walked down into the street to stop a public execution. A big man caught a small man stealing his car, and everyone in Brooklyn heard the car alarm wail of the condemned, he's killing me. At a word from you, the executioner's hand slipped from the hair of the thief. The kid was high, was all you said when you came back to us. When I was a boy and you were God, we flew to Puerto Rico. You said my grandfather was the mayor of Utuado. His name was Buenaventura. That means good fortune. I believed in your grandfather's name. I heard the tree frogs chanting to each other all night. I saw a banana leaf and elephant palm sprouting from the mountain's belly. I gnawed the mango's pit and the sweet yellow hair stuck between my teeth. I said to you, you came from another planet. How'd you do it? You said, every morning, just before I woke up, I saw the mountains. Every morning, I see the mountains. En Utuado, three sisters, all in their 70s, all bedridden, all Pentecostales, who only left the house for church, lay sleeping on mattresses spread across the floor when the hurricane gutted the mountain the way a butcher slices open a dangled pig and a rolling wall of mud buried them, leaving the fourth sister to stagger into the street, screaming like an unheeded prophet about the end of the world. A Utualo, a man who cultivated a garden of aguacate and carambola, feeding the avocado and star fruit to his nieces from New York so the trees in his garden beheaded all at once like the soldiers of a beaten army, and so hanged himself. A Utualo, a welder and a handyman, rigged a pulley with a shopping cart to ferry rice and beans across the river where the bridge collapsed, witnessed the cart swaying above so many hands that raised a sign that told the helicopters, Campamento los olvidados. Camp of the Forgotten. Los olvidados wait seven hours in line for a government meal of Skittles and Vienna sausage, or a tarp to cover the bones of a house with no roof, as the fungus grows on their skin from sleeping on mattresses drenched with the spit of the hurricane. They drink the brown water waiting for microscopic monsters in their bellies to visit plagues upon them. A nurse says, these people are gonna have an epidemic. These people are gonna die. The president flips rolls of paper towels through a crowd at a church in Guanabo, Zeus lobbing thunderbolts on the locked ward of his delusions. Down the block, cousin Ricardo, Bernice's boy, says that somebody stole his can of diesel. I heard somebody ask you once what Puerto Rico needed to be free, and you said, Tres pulgadas de sangre la calle. Three inches of blood in the street. Now, Three inches of mud flow through the streets of Utualo, and troops patrol the town as if guarding the vein of copper in the ground, as if a shovel digging graves in the backyard might strike the ore below, as if La Brigada swinging machetes to clear the road might remember the last uprising. I know you are not God. I have the proof seven pounds of ashes in a box on my bookshelf. Gods do not die, and yet I want you to be God again. 
stride from the crowd to seize the president's arm before another roll of paper towel sails away. Thunder, Spanish obscenities in his face, banish him to a roofless rainstorm in Utuado so he unravels one soaked sheet after another till there is nothing left but his cardboard heart. I promised myself I would stop talking to you. White box of gray grit, you were deaf even before you died. Hear my promise now. I will take you to the mountains where houses lost like ships at sea rise blue and yellow from the mud. I will open my hands. I will scatter your ashes. Engutualo. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gracias.